Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. For the last few weeks, we have been talking about sonship, what it means to be the sons of God. As we already took seven base scriptures, John 1, 12 and Romans 8, 14, Galatians 3, 26. Galatians 3, 26 says you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then also Ephesians 1, 5, Philippians 2, 15, 1 John 3, 1 and 1 John 3, 2. These all show us that we are the sons of God. But we need to understand what does that mean? And so Jesus told a parable to illustrate and explain what it means to be a son of And we read that parable in Luke chapter 15. That parable is most commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. However, as we've talked about it in these last few weeks, we see that this parable is not only about one son, the younger son. It is about two sons and not only about two sons, but also about two sons and a father. And we see that the younger son represents those who are living and operating outside of the kingdom of God. They have gone into a distant country. Those are people that are both born, those that are not born again, and also those who may have been born again, but they are backslidden and away from God. But then we see that the older son is a picture of many Christians today. He is still in the kingdom of God. In this parable, the father represents God. The estate in this parable is the kingdom of God. And so the older son had stayed on the estate. However, he was living and acting and talking and thinking like a slave. And we see that his problem is having a slave mentality. And so we were talking about and the comparison and contrast between a slave and a son. And so to summarize this, basically to be a son means that you have rights, privileges, and benefits. I illustrated those privileges and rights when we looked at Acts chapter 22 and Paul had been ar- arrested by the Romans and they had stretched him out to flog him and he spoke up and he said, is it legal to flog a Roman citizen? You see, he knew his rights. He knew his rights as a Roman citizen. Many Christians today do not understand that they have rights as children of God and citizens of the kingdom of God. Satan has no legal right unless you give him the right to hurt you, to harm you, to steal, kill, and destroy, as it says in John 10.10. He has no legal right, and yet many Christians don't know that. Well, what if Paul had not known that he did not have rights as a Roman citizen. He would have allowed the Roman centurion and, and, and the uh, group there to flog him. He would have been beaten, but he spoke up and he demanded his rights. And so as children of God, we need to know that we have rights and privileges as it says in John chapter, I mean, uh, Galatians chapter four, Galatians 4 says in verse 5, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. So you see, being a son of God means that we have rights, privileges, and benefits. It also means that we have an inheritance. And I spent a lot of time yesterday talking about the inheritance. And we looked at several scriptures that talk about our inheritance. We see in Romans 8, 17, it says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so we see that we are joint heirs with Christ. Jesus Christ is our 
older brother, our eldest brother. He does not, however, take the special privileges of being firstborn to get greater privileges than us. No, he shares his inheritance with us. We are joint heirs with him. And we see all these other scriptures that we looked at yesterday that we are heirs of God and we have an inheritance. So we have an inher- inheritance. We also see that a son owns everything that the father has, just as the father in Luke 15 said in verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. So all that the father has is ours. We have ownership with him. We have inheritance from him. We have rights, privileges, and benefits. Not only that, we have authority. We were talking about the authority. A slave has no authority, but the son has authority. The slave receives orders. The son can give orders. As children of God, we have authority to rule and reign with Christ. And we will be talking about that in some of the next broadcasts that we do. But we will see the authority that we have to rule and reign with Christ. And then also being a son means that we have responsibility, responsibility, just as the father was desiring sons, the sons should have been by his side. They should have been learning from him, watching him, listening to everything he said, and then imitating him. As it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. So as children of God, we should be imitators of God. We should be learning how to live like him, act like him, and talk like him, and to do everything he is doing. As we said, that the son should be learning the father's business, so that when the son gets old enough, he can rule and run and manage in that business. This is all a picture of growing up. We learn these things growing up in the kingdom of God. We grow up to receive more responsibility, to qualify for more authority, and to obtain more and more of our inheritance by growing up in Christ, by learning the laws of the kingdom of God, as we have talked about in the teaching on the kingdom of God, the spiritual laws of the kingdom and how the kingdom operates and how the father does what he does. That's all that the father is desiring for the sons to learn. That's what the sons should be learning, how to do the father's business. Amen. So we see that these, what it means to be a son means that we have rights, privileges, and benefits. It means that we have an inheritance. It means we have ownership. It means that we have authority. And it means that we have responsibility. Remember, Jesus said also, he must be about his father's business and his father is working and he too must work. We must work the work of our father. Amen. We must work the work of our father. Now I want us to go back to Luke 15 again and look at something that the younger son was saying or going to say to the father and then look at the father's response in Luke chapter 15. After the younger son had hired himself out to work in the fields and to feed pigs, it says in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Now stop there a minute. If he was a long way off and his father saw him, obviously it means the father was looking. The father was looking because he would not have seen him if he wasn't looking for him. The father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And in verse 21, it says, The son said to him, now remember what the son was planning to say. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now he had intended to also say, make me like one of your hired men, like one of your servants. But notice what the father did. He didn't even let the younger son finish his statement. And he cut him off. He interrupted and he said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So notice he interrupted the younger son and didn't let the younger son finish what he was going to say, because the younger son was going to say, make me like one of your hired men or like one of your servants. But the father cut him off and didn't let him say it. He said, I'm the younger son said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Why did the father not let him finish what he was going to say? Because the father's heart was crying out and he was saying, I don't need any more servants. I want a son. You see, we had said that the younger son had a problem. He was away from the father. The older son had a problem. He was on the estate, but thinking and living and talking like a slave. But the father also had a problem. It was a very sad problem. Remember? Oh, well, the father's problem was that he had no one acting like a son. And so his heart cry, the father's heart cry is for sons. Remember, I mentioned that even when we talked on the story of the glory last year in September of 2013, that the, in the story of the glory, we see the purpose. Why did God create man? God did not. It is commonly said God created man. And if you ask people and I've asked people and when I'm teaching this lesson, why did God create man? The two most common answers God created man to worship him and God created man to serve him. Those are both wrong as far as the primary reason for creating man, because God created the angels before he created man. And what do the angels do? There are 10,000 times 10,000 angels. And another scripture says an innumerable company of angels. They cannot be counted. If there are so many angels, they cannot be counted. What do they do? The angels are the servants of God and the angels are worshiping God. And they've been there long before man was ever created. And so if God already had angels to serve him and he already had angels to worship him, then what was the need for making man to serve him and worship him? That's not the reason why God made man. God said in Genesis 1 26, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. In other words, to be like us. And so we see God created man in his own image so that man could be his sons. And remember, sons includes male and female. In Galatians 3, 27, 28, it says there is neither male nor female in Christ, for you are all one in Christ. So when it when the Bible talks about the sons of God, it's both male and female. But we are created in the image of God to be the sons of God. We are created because, number one, 
God wanted sons. God wanted a family. And that's why in Hebrews chapter one, it says Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. But then in chapter two, verse 10, it says Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. Many sons, many sons is the father's heart. Many sons is the father's desire. And so when the younger son came home and said, I'm not worthy to be called your son, make me a servant. The father is crying out. I don't need any more servants. I've got plenty of servants. I want a son. And so that was the father's desperate cry. He wanted sons and he wanted sons to be by his side, acting like sons, doing what sons should be doing. And so we should be doing what sons should be doing. Amen. Amen. And then take a look also in Luke 15 again and verse 22. And the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now, there are three things there that we see that the father gave to the son in order to restore him to the position of sonship, sonship, this position. He gave him three things, the robe, the ring, and the sandals. Well, what does the robe represent? Well, let's go back to Genesis. When do we see a robe in the book of Genesis? You know, there is the what the Bible there's um, in the interpretation of scripture, there is what is called the law of first mention, the law of first mention. And that is when you look and find the first time something is mentioned in the scriptures. Well, we go back to the book of Genesis and the word Genesis means beginning and it's the book of beginnings. And so we see in Genesis, we see in Genesis 37, verse 3, 37, 3, that Jacob had made a coat of many colors. It says actually Israel in Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. Another translation says coat, a coat of many colors. Another translation means is the word tunic, coat, tunic, robe. This is the very first time that this word is used in the Bible. So in the law of first mention, It says that the first time a word is used in the scripture, it sets a precedent and a rule for the meaning of that word that will be carried all through the scripture every time it's used. And so we see here in Genesis 37 verse three, the richly ornamented robe or the coat of many colors That word coat or a robe or tunic in different translations, the first time that word is used in the Bible anywhere in scripture is right here in Genesis 37, three. And this robe or coat that Joseph was given by his father made his brothers hate him. Notice it says in verse four, Genesis 37, four, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him. Now, why did these brothers hate him because of the coat? Was it simply that he was given a pretty coat? No, that would be really not reasonable anyway, because they were all plenty wealthy where they could all make themselves a coat and color it many colors. It was beautiful. Yes, it was a special gift. Yes, but it wasn't just because it was a pretty coat that it made the brothers angry. 
the reason the brothers were angry was because this coat represented the father's choice or the father's pick for who would be the next leader of the clan, the next head of the clan, the next one to rule over the clan. In other words, the father was selecting his successor in leading the clan, being the head of the clan, being the boss or the ruler of the clan by giving that coat to Joseph. It was saying, Joseph, you are the one I pick to be my successor. When I'm gone, you will rule and lead this clan. You will be head of this clan. Now that's why it was so insulting to the other brothers because here was Joseph, the second youngest of the 12 and he had 10 older brothers and the father had picked the second youngest to become the head over all the others. That's why it was so offensive. Well, we see then that the robe represents authority. And this father back in Luke 15 again gave this son a robe. It was the same meaning as in Genesis 37. It represents spiritual authority for us. It's spiritual authority. It's the authority that we wear, that we carry as sons of God to rule in his name. When Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He gave us that authority. The robe represents the authority to rule. The ring that the father gave in Luke 15 is it's a, a ring was often used as a signet ring, a signature. In other words, it was like the father's signature. It's the father's stamp. In other words, it had, it carried the father's authority. It's like the father's name and it included all kinds of power and authority. It was like a, in a way it was also could be used for a credit card and you could say here, I'm going to go buy this and I'm going to stamp my father's ring on this payment to be paid by my father. So it's like the father giving him a credit card and saying, you can buy anything in my my name. You can do anything in my name. Just sign it in my name. It is the name of the father. And then the sandals on the feet represent the full supply and provision and status of sonship because slaves and servants did not wear shoes. They would go barefooted. So being that he was given sandals, since he was given sandals, it showed full supply full provision for every need and status of sonship. So we see that the father gave him the the robe representing spiritual authority, the ring, which was also authority and power. It was like the name of the father. We have been given the name of Jesus. We have been given the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. I will do it. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Jesus said in John 14. And then the, the sandals represented full supply and provision and showed full status of sonship. So we see that the father was longing and desiring for sons and let's look again in Romans chapter eight, verse 19. It says the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. You see, all of creation is waiting for the sons of God. It's time for you and me and all of the church, the body of Christ to rise up, rise up, come back into full sonship status. Recognize your rights and privileges and benefits. Recognize and take your inheritance. Don't be like the older 
son who didn't even know he had an inheritance and left it and complained about not having anything. Recognize your ownership in the kingdom, being co and joint owner with Christ and in the, with the Father. Recognize your authority to rule, the robe of authority, the, the name of Jesus, which was represented in the signet ring, that you have that name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. So don't leave any of your benefits or privileges. Remember, that's John 14, 13. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the son may bring glory to the father. And John 14, 14, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So it's time for you and me and the church to rise up exercise our authority, exercise the name of Jesus. Remember verses 20 and 21, the creation is waiting to be liberated from the curse. We can bring in the name of Jesus. We can bring liberty from the curse to all of creation. Recognize who you are. Receive all that God has for you. Receive your inheritance, receive ownership, receive the benefits and privileges, and then exercise your authority and exercise your responsibilities to do the Father's work. Remember, we have work to be done. There is work to be done, and we must be about our Father's business. Well, praise the Lord. I'm out of time again, and we will talk more about these things next week on this broadcast. Remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.